And then today he takes this mighty sermon he's preached and he wraps it up with just as powerful of an application, just as much of a heart-checking, gut-searching application here in verses 41 to 47 as he exposes the consciences and the hearts of his listeners. And he makes it very clear four distinct reasons why they were not taking him at his word. And today we can learn from this as well why we often do not take Jesus at his word. There's a lot of doubt in the world. You know that. A lot of skepticism in the world. In fact, I saw an article in the beginning of February. CNN covered it, but it had been in the news and made the media rounds before I had read about it. The title of the article was this. Does Papyrus say that Jesus had a wife? And the article was about a fragment, a manuscript that was found, that in it made a statement. Jesus said, quote, let me read it to you here. Jesus said to them, my wife. And the fragment's very small, and then the rest of the sentence is missing, so we don't know what comes after it. Well, this was a big deal for some people. It was kind of like the Da Vinci Code regurgitated, and then we had another article attacking Jesus and what the Bible says about Jesus. And immediately, CNN and Fox News and CBS all cover this and start to cast doubt and skepticism at what the Bible says and what Jesus said about himself. It's amazing. And now, I'm not a trained textual critic, but I've studied textual criticism and the original manuscripts of the Bible and trying to understand um, the, the historicity of them and so on and so forth. And I looked at this manuscript, and what they did not tell you when I did research is this manuscript was written, dated 400 years after Jesus. So it's not like it's an early manuscript. 400 years later, it's written in Coptic, which was the early... Uh, Christian language that was spoken in Egypt in the church, and this manuscript was just messy looking. It didn't look like a scribe would have written it. It looked like um, a kid almost. It was just so messy. Well, I did a little more research into the manuscript as I was looking at it, and I found out that in 2012, this manuscript just appeared as a Harvard professor named Karen King brought it to the attention of the public. And what's very interesting here is the, the news articles are all saying, did Jesus have a wife? Is the Bible been disproven? But what they don't tell you is that the fragment stops right at the spot where it says, quote, Jesus said to them, my wife, and then we don't know what the rest of the statement is. In fact, I found it great. Sometimes uh, some of the, the, the Daily Show people n are better at defending the faith than Christians are. John Stewart actually took this manuscript on and made fun of it. And, and I can just think of it uh, kind of this way. He said, Jesus said to them, my wife doesn't exist. I don't have one, you know. Uh, we don't know what it said after that. Well, Everyone immediately doubts the Bible, doubts that Jesus is who he says he is. And all of a sudden, they do a little more research, come to find out, they find that this manuscript was not surfaced on its own, that it came with a whole other collection of manuscripts. And they begin to research them, and come February 1st, they give the news that all the manuscripts that came with this really messy, weird-looking manuscript were forgeries. They were not real. And so the CNN article says this. It had to eat some humble pie. It says this. It seemed real. It seemed fake. It seemed real again. And now we're back to it being fake. And yet TV programs, newspaper articles, magazine articles, journals were reading, doubting the words of Jesus, doubting the Bible so quickly at something that they really had no credibility over. Now I bring that up to you today, church. Bring that up to you today, friends, because the point is people will use anything they can to doubt and be skeptical of who Jesus is and what he has said and what he has done. We are quick to do so. There might be some of you today that doubt some of the things that are in the Bible, and I'm glad you're here this morning with us. Thank you for joining us. Because I want you to understand you're not alone in your doubts. And Jesus here makes it very clear why we don't take him at his word. I would dare to say there's some Christians in here, professing Christians, who profess Jesus, but for some reason try to separate Jesus from his word. And we'll get into why that is, but I'm going to tell you something very clearly at the beginning of this. You cannot separate Jesus as a person from Jesus and what he said. 
It's a complete package. You can't take one without the other. So let's hear John chapter 5. We're going to wrap up the series today, read verses 41 to 47, and let's consider why we don't take Jesus at his word. And then we'll pray. John chapter 5, beginning at verse 41. Jesus says, I do not receive honor for men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in, my, in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, help us today to check our hearts. Help us to see our doubts. May they come to the surface today. Help us to see our spiritual condition before you. And I pray, O oh Father, that we would not be quick to doubt, but instead we would be quick to believe. And that our prayer would be the prayer of the man in the New Testament who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief today. I pray that you would do a mighty work in our hearts. Holy Spirit of God, we ask that you would be probing deep inside of us, exposing our concerns and answering them with your mercy. And we will give thanks in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. We're going to see four points this morning as to why we don't take Jesus at his word. The first one that we're going to look at today is we have a lack of desire to come to him. That's found in the first two verses that we've just read, 41 and 42. Jesus says this, I did not come to receive honor from you, to receive honor for men. Now, the religious leaders, the enemies of Jesus, are surely starting to uh, think to themselves, why has Jesus just explained that he is God? Why has Jesus uh, here launched into this long defense, giving all of these reasons why we should believe who he is and what he says? And they probably began to think, we know why he's saying these things to us. He's saying these things to us because we criticized him. He healed this man who had been sick for 38 years. And then instead of praising him and honoring him for this wonderful, compassionate work he did, we criticized him and said he broke the Sabbath. And so he's probably saying these words here because he just wanted our praise. He just wanted our honor. And he's angry at us that we didn't give him the praise and honor he deserves. Jesus makes it very clear here that he does not want fair weather friends. He didn't come here to say these things to get superficial human applause. He doesn't have ambition as his motive to preach these truths we have heard the last five weeks together. He did not want hypocritical praise and honor from those who privately repudiated him. I would say to you today, there's a lot of us that are fair weather friends of God. When things are going good, we honor him in some superficial way. When things are going bad, we ignore him and we run from him. Jesus did not come to get fair weather praise. He didn't come to get some outward show when inwardly things were not right. He did not come just for us to make his ego feel better. In fact, God doesn't have an ego like we have at all. But this is how we often think of God, that because we do something, we have tickled God's ears and make God happy with us, as if our works could ever give back to God. You know, I, I think in life, there's easy ways to illustrate this in all of our lives. You know how it feels when someone talks bad about you behind your back, smears your reputation, stabs you in the side, and then when they run into you face to face, they act like nothing ever happened, right? Right? You know what that's like. It's uncomfortable. I remember um, there was a family who were members here at the church many, 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 many years ago. 
back in the beginning years here, and, and they came, and all of a sudden, they, they started disappearing, and they ran into a, another individual of the church, and they began to immediately speak against me as the pastor of the church. And they said I was hard to understand, and I didn't really care about their family, and I was too legalistic, and I preached too long. Imagine that. They at least got one thing right in the list of complaints. And all of a sudden, like six months later, a really hard situation came up in their family. And guess who they called on? Called on me. And all of a sudden, I was the best preacher, and they got so much for my messages, and they wanted to come back. And I have to tell you, in the flesh, I kind of had a hard time receiving their words because I was kind of holding what they had said against them. Well, here's the difference between me and, and, and God. God knows exactly whether their intentions are right or not. God does not need honor from us. He is not needy coveting our favor. In fact, God said to Job in chapter 41, verse 11 of his book, he said, who has first given to me that I would repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. Why in the world do we often think that Jesus is the one who is lost and Jesus is the one who is needy of us? We talk about God like God's lost and we're trying to find him. No, we are the ones who are lost and he is finding us. See, we've messed it all up. He doesn't need our honor at all. He doesn't need your money in the offering. He doesn't need you to do good works. But when you do them from a heart that is changed, he receives them because they show him for who he is. That's the difference. Now, the word honor here has the idea of glory and praise. It's where we get the, the English word doxology from. It's doxa or doxin in Greek. And the point of this is Jesus is letting us know very clearly, look, Jesus didn't come to this earth and go through all these things because of a big ego or because he is in some terrible need of us because he's lost and doesn't feel complete without us at all. Jesus said in John 5, 34, I say these things so that you may be saved. In verse 40, he said last week as we ended up, you refuse to come to me that you may have life. The problem is not on God's end. If you're not, if you're not a Christian today and you've come to church, I want you to hear this. The problem is not that God is weak or that God is not able or God has distanced himself from us. So many of us live that way. And, and a lot of us, we say our, our sins are too great for God. We say that um, the weakness and limitation is on God's side. That uh, the gospel is only for good people. I want you to understand here, as we read these words, we need to know that it is not men's sins that keep us from being saved because sins can be forgiven. It is not the weakness of God or the limit of the power of Jesus saving grace that keeps us from honoring him. It is not a limitation on the wide, free, broad offer of the gospel that God is even offering you today to have your heart changed. The problem is with our will. The problem is we are dead in our sins and we choose the wrong thing instead of the right thing. The limitation is not in God. The limitation is in ourselves. In fact, in Ezekiel 33... The Lord says, as I live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from their ways and live. So he says, turn back. Why will you die? Turn back. The problem is not with God. The problem is on our end. Man, if he is saved, is entirely of God. And man, if he is lost, it is entirely of self. Our problem is us. That's the problem. We have a, a lack of desire to come to him and believe in him. Why? Because we have a lack of love to God, number two. Look at verse 42. Again, Jesus continues here. I know you. You do not have the love of God in you. When Jesus says, I know you, he is not speaking like you and I assume to speak and say we know people. Look, some of you know me here. Some of you know me more close than others. Some of us know each other by handshakes. Some of us uh, know us deeper because I've spent more time with you as the people of God and as friends in the body of Christ. But Jesus sees deeper than everyone. He knows us deeper than anyone else. Because when Jesus looks at us and knows us, he knows what's inside of our hearts. Many times in the Bible, Jesus answers questions before someone ever asks the question out loud. 
but he knew what was inside of them. That's how this book began in chapter 2, verse 25, where Jesus did not entrust himself to the people because he knew what was in man. Before what, Philip was under the fig tree, Jesus saw him and he knew him. In fact, at the end of the book, at the end of the gospel in chapter 21, there's this amazing scene after Jesus has rose from the grave in which Peter is talking to the Lord. And Jesus asks him, Peter, do you love me? Well, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he asks him this over and over again. And then in John 21, Peter says this. He says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. You see, the point is, after three years with Jesus, he was 100% explicitly in full conviction that Jesus knew the depths of his heart. He had no doubt about it. And I want to tell you, the closer you get to God, the more you'll see how much he really knows. You'll see how wise he is, how omniscient he is. And even though we won't always understand all of his decisions, we will bow before him because we will know they are good. We will know they were right. Now, it's important here that he knows their hearts. He knows that it's not agape love that is filling their hearts, self-sacrificing, giving love. Instead, it is the lack of love. See, many of us, why we don't take Jesus at his word is we hide behind excuses. We say there's intellectual reasons why we don't believe. But Jesus doesn't answer all the intellectual issues of the day. Instead, Jesus goes to the root of the matter in all of us. He says it's not about the intellect. It's not about your questions, even though he does answer their questions many times. He says the issue is far deeper than your brain. It goes down to the soul, to the heart of the matter. In other words, you can convince the mind, you can prick the conscience, but bottom line, if you love other things more than God, you do not have faith and you do not believe. Now again, if you're not a Christian, you're not a, a Christ follower here today, you're probably saying, you don't know me, Pastor. I'm a loving person. I love my wife. I love my kids. I, I love my family. I love my job. I love whatever. And you're saying, that's pretty judgmental of you because I do have love. Well, what I want to say to you today is the problem is you have attained love. You have attained love. And that's exactly what Jesus is getting at here. You see, your love is tainted with pride. It's tainted with pride. Let me explain this to you. Pride is the root sin of all sin. Pride is not one sin among, my, among many sins. Pride is the root of which all of our sins flow. And so I want you to think about this for a minute. I heard Tim Keller explain pride this way. Pride is like the carbon monoxide of all of our sins. Carbon monoxide, you can't see it, right? It's an invisible gas. But if it's present, it slowly kills you. It is odorless. You can't smell it. But if you're exposed to it long enough, it makes you sick. Pride is like carbon monoxide in that it can't be seen, it's odorless, and without any knowledge of it filling the room, it taints your life until you take your last breath and you are gone. Keller said it's the Petri dish that grows all kinds of evil stuff in your life. You have to look at it through a microscope, but it is below, under the surface of everything that's wrong inside of you. Jesus sees into their hearts, and he knows how they feel about themselves, what they say about themselves, how they think about themselves. In fact, later on in Luke chapter 11, Jesus said, Woe to you, Pharisees, because you tithe your mint and your rue and your herb. In other words, they were really sticklers about the law. They went farther than what the, the Bible said in the law. But you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have had these and neglected the other things you added to the law. The problem was a lack of love in their hearts that caused their inability to believe. They didn't have love for God, love of God. In fact, 1 John tells us very clearly that it is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. You can't do that without love in your heart. You can't do that. In fact, 1 John says that this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. A lack of love is a blinding thing. And some of you that are struggling, struggling in your relationships and you feel like you can't, just can't get over the hurdles and the barriers, I would surmise that many of it is because of the pride of your own hearts. 
It's the lack of love inside of you that keeps you from doing what God says for you to do. You love yourself a little bit more than you love the things of God. You love yourself a little bit more than you love your children or your spouse. That you have this kind of self-love that is very unhealthy and it has caused you to have a blind heart towards who God is and not look at him objectively. It's like all these people that immediately when that CNN story came out, immediately... They jumped on the bandwagon that Jesus was married and the Bible is not true. They didn't read Coptic. They were not textual critics. They didn't understand the whole history behind manuscripts. They just would jump at any opportunity to not have to be held accountable and believe because they're missing love inside of them. And so Jesus in Matthew 15 speaks quoting Isaiah and he says this, You people honor me with your lips, but your heart is far away from me, and in vain you're worshiping me. We see this lack of desire to come to him, and a lack of real love to God, and it's really expressed in verse 43. Jesus says, look, I've come in, in my Father's name. I've come under his fluence, influence as his representative. But if another comes in my name, you will receive him. You will follow him. You will obey him. Now, this is very interesting. Very interesting. You do not receive me. They rejected Jesus. He came into his own, and his own people did not receive him. See, this is the problem. You can't take God and leave Jesus out of the equation. And I would say to you who have grown up in the cultural Bible Belt South, you can't take Jesus and reject the Father. They are one in the same. Two different persons, but one God. It is a combo package. You can't get one without the other. And a lot of people, like the Jesus of the New Testament, it's because they haven't really read the whole New Testament, they don't like the God of the Old Testament. You can't separate the two. They're the same person. They're not different. And, and Jesus is making it clear here, you're not receiving me, and if you don't receive me, you're not receiving the, mo the Father. But here's the problem. You prove this by receiving other people. You prove that you don't have the love of God because you're following all this garbage out there. You receive other people all the time that are not right. In fact, in Jesus' day, there was two famous rabbis that the people really held to, Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel. They weren't God followers, they were Shammai followers. They were Hillel father followers, right? And this continues on, and prophetically, I think Jesus is speaking here. Josephus records, or some Jewish historians record, that there were as many as 64 different false messiahs that came within the next hundred years after Jesus. People who came said they were the Messiah, said they were going to save Israel, and they failed one after another. In fact, this came to a head in the year 132, where a man named Simon Bar Kokhba became uh, the, the Jewish Messiah. Everyone believed in him about 100 years after Jesus. And uh, even the greatest rabbi that was alive, according to history, Rabbi Akiba, he called Simon Bar Kokhba the uh, fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Old Testament, including Numbers 24, 17. He said that he is the star out of Jacob that the Old Testament prophesied of. And the Jewish people followed him as if he was God until the Romans crushed their revolt and dispersed them throughout the whole world. It seems probable to me that these words have not find their, found their final fulfillment because Jesus warned later on in Matthew 24 of one of his last sermons, the sermon that he gave before he died on the cross. He said that in the last days people will come and they will say, look, here is the Christ and look, there is the Christ. Do not believe it. For there will be many false Christs and prophets, and they will perform even great signs and wonders. And if it was possible, they would deceive God's elect, his chosen people. If it was possible, but it's not. And we see today, don't we see this today? Just so many people that claim to represent God, but their words don't equal with what God has said. And if you listen to their message, their message is not about the Lord. It's about their ministry and what they can do and who they are and how great they are. It's not about the message of the gospel and taking up the cross and following Christ and that it's Christ alone, by faith alone, and grace alone, to God alone be the glory. 
the, the message is about health and wealth and prosperity and feel good and do good and smile big and bright and get your teeth bleached and everything will be okay with you. And friends, here's the bottom line. That's not the gospel. It's not the message of Jesus because those 21 Egyptian Coptic Protestants who gave their lives last week, that was not the message of the gospel they held to, was it? Their message of the gospel is take up your cross because Jesus is worthy and follow him even if you lose everything. The, the idea that you have this little God-shaped hole in your heart and God is lost and you need to find God and put him in this little hole and everything will be better is so far into the Bible. The Bible says you need a new heart. You don't have a God-shaped hole. You have a heart that is at war with God and you need a new heart. You need new life. You are dead in your sins. You can't see, and his Holy Spirit will make you see. Not that you have to keep doing and doing and doing to make God happy with you and keep planting financial seeds so God will be happy with you and answer your prayers. No, Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. The work is done. But so many are so deceived by all of these teachings that are out there today. And I think this will find its greatest culmination in the one that we call the Antichrist. I believe there will be a personal, literal uh, man who will be anti or against or another Christ. He will be opposed and the world will follow him. And we see people, they're so desperate to believe something. Actually, they're desperate to believe anything but the truth because they don't love it. And, and more on that some other day. But bottom line, we choose the wrong things every time, don't we? Because we refuse to believe. In fact, if you don't think this is true, think about the crucifixion of Jesus. They have the choice. Do they choose Barabbas or do they choose Jesus? Let's think about this for a minute. Jesus heals people, loves people, feeds people, preaches the truth to people, fears no man. He, he calls the kettle black when it's black, right? He's honest. He's loving. And then we've got Barabbas who's a murderer. He's broken the eighth commandment. He's an insurrectionist. He's rebelled against Rome. And he is a, a robber, a thief. So he's broken the sixth commandment in murder. He's broken the eighth commandment in stealing. He has rebelled against the government. Who do we choose? Jesus, who heals us and loves us and feeds us and cares about us. Or do we choose the thief, the robber, the murderer, the insurrectionist? Who do they choose? Well, the heart leads them to choose the wrong guy. They choose Barabbas. And I want to say to you, we have a little Barabbas in all of us. We have all stolen. We have robbed God of his glory with our pride and our self-narcissistic, self-centered, all-about-me attitudes. <coughs> Why do we have so many struggles in our lives? Because it's all about me instead of the one who loves me and died for me. We have committed the crime of insurrection. We have rebelled against God. We have not done things God's way. We have done it our own way. And then we have committed the crime of murder, at least in our hearts, with the hatred that we have towards others. And we are on death row like Barabbas because we've chosen wrong. We are on death row, and Barabbas was going to die, it seems, for his crimes against the government and against his fellow man. And in the same way, the wages of our sin is death. We are under the sentence of condemnation. And Jesus comes, and what does he do? Even though we choose the wrong guy every time on our own, Jesus takes Barabbas' place. And he takes your place and my place as he dies as our substitute on the cross. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the good news. God loves you even when you are loveless. He pursues you anyhow. Do you hear that today? Loves you. The third point we want to see here, lack of desire to come, lack of real love to God, lack of desire for God's praise. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? How can you put your faith and trust if you receive honor from one another. In other words, the grand obstacle of their salvation is this selfish, flattering pride they have thinking so highly of themselves in which they live for the ambition and vanity and love and approval of others. They care more for pleasing men than they do for pleasing God. 
They did everything they could to be seen of others, to gain the applause of others. They chose the uppermost rooms at the feast. They wanted the chief seat in the synagogue, which evidently is not the front row in a modern Baptist church. They cared more for pleasing men than God by titles. They wanted people to call them rabbi, rabbi, and father, father. And Jesus says, call no man these things. In fact, in Matthew 6, he said, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be seen of others, because then you'll have no reward. Some of them, when they gave their offering, their money at the temple, they would have a trumpet blown before they'd walk in and put their money in the plate. The modern equivalent is taking all that change you collected all the week and slamming it right into the, the offering plate. Or on the week that you give more than you normally give, making sure your check isn't folded in half. It's kept wide open for everyone to see, right? You know, it's telling everybody how much you gave. Telling everybody what you did. Jesus said this, don't let your left hand know what your right hand it did. Keep it quiet. Leave it between you and God. You don't need anyone else's favor. You need God's. That's who it's supposed to be for. He said, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners because they want to be seen by everybody. Phoniness. Instead, and look, we can smell these guys a mile away, can't we? We know it's not from the heart. It's phony. And you're not fooling anybody. I just want you to know today, if you think you're fooling the pastor, um, some of you might be, but the majority of you aren't. Okay? And I'm not God. I'm just a fallible, messed up guy in the front that gets the opportunity to preach the good news to you every week. And, and if you think you're fooling your spouse, you might fool them for a little while, but it's not going to last long. And if you think you're fooling your children, I'm going to tell you something. You might be able to fool them by, you know, putting them to bed and, and doing things when they're at school. I'm telling you, they're going to figure it out eventually. One day it's going to be pretty clear to them what was really going on because what, comes, what is in the heart eventually comes out, doesn't it? And is exposed. In fact, Numbers says it this way, be sure your sin will find you out. And these men, all they cared about was the praise of others. They didn't love the Bible. They loved scholarship. And two, there are many people out there. This is not a problem in many Southern Baptist circles, unfortunately. But there are a lot of people out there that care more about scholarship than in knowing God. That care more about Bible knowledge than a heart that knows God. That's why J.I. Packer, in his early years as a minister and a professor, he wrote a book, and he didn't entitle it Knowing Scripture. He entitled it Knowing God. Because the chief end of us is not to know about God, know about His Word. It's to know Him personally from the very depths of our being. So you do not seek the honor that comes from the only God. What is the honor that comes from God? You are born again. You are a son and daughter of the living God. Listen, you may not get this, but this is huge. Uh, there, there's someone that, in one of the, the ministries that our church is involved in, they're not a member of this congregation. They don't come here ever and worship. But, but in one of our uh, outreaches that we do, I, I get to see them a lot. And, and this young woman found out that the person she thought her whole life was her biological father really was not her biological father. And she's in her late 20s. And it was crushing to her. It hurt her deeply. And it was a very humiliating way that she found out as the, the person who claimed to be discounted her uh, in front of and publicly pushed her to the side and humiliated her. She was hurt. And by the grace of God, I had an opportunity to just share a little bit of scripture and pray for her. And I shared the scripture in the Psalms that God is a father to the fatherless. And she was downcast. She was destroyed when she had heard that this was not her earthly father. But I'm going to tell you, church, when the, the word of God connected with her heart, it was like the plane came in for a landing and it came home inside of her. And, and, and there was a homecoming at that moment because she went from total despair and lostness to overwhelming peace and joy that God loved her and the love of God was inside of her. And God, before eternity, had set his affections on her, not because she was deserving, but because he is good and was her father. Her life was changed. And, and 
we don't think this, but this is an honor to be sons and daughters of God. It, to be clothed with the robe of righteousness and the garments of salvation and to be citizens of his kingdom that will last forever. It's greater than being an American citizen. It's great to be an American. We have a lot of blessings, but I'm telling you, there is a citizenship in heaven that is far greater and more lasting. My friends, we must understand here that if they admitted the claims of Jesus, at the same time, they would lose the esteem of their peers. And there's many people that will not believe because they're afraid of what they'll lose instead of what they'll gain. You know, we always pitch the gospel as, well, you're going to gain this, and you're going to gain that. You're going to be happy, and God has a wonderful plan for your life, and everything's going to be great and hunky-dory if you just pray this prayer and you receive Jesus. No, Jesus said, if you follow me, you're going to have to take up a cross, which means you're going to have to die to self, which means you might lose things to gain what lasts forever. And we need to remember that's part of the gospel. And we can't separate that. These men were afraid to believe. His glory was everywhere. His honor was everywhere. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his honor, his glory, his doxa. That's the word that's used. His miracles and his love was everywhere. But they refused to believe. We end right here, verses 45 to 47. Look at this. We've seen a lack of desire to come to him, a lack of real love to God, a lack of desire for God's praise. Lastly, a lack of real faith in God's word. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. If you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Jesus is saying here, look, I didn't come here to accuse you. I don't have to accuse you. They're probably thinking, well, Jesus is accusing us like we accused him. We accused him of breaking the Sabbath in the beginning of the chapter. No. Jesus says, I don't have to accuse you. I didn't come here to accuse people. I am not here to bring condemnation into the world. You are already under condemnation. Do you understand that? Jesus didn't come for that. In fact, the story in John chapter 8, a beautiful story of a woman who was maliciously taken in adultery and thrown at the feet of Jesus, humiliated before him. And Jesus says, woman, where are your accusers? They're not there. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus didn't come to accuse us. He doesn't have to accuse us. We're already accused. Now, it's difficult for us to understand how profoundly shocked and outraged the Jewish leaders probably were when they heard Jesus say that Moses in whom you trust will accuse you. They were probably blown away by this. Look, Moses is still read in the synagogues today. Moses is the man in Judaism. I mean, Moses is what it's all about, right? The law. They love the law and they love Moses. They put unbounded confidence in Moses. In fact, the Jewish writer Philo says that Moses was considered the intercessor of Israel. So like Roman Catholics may look to the saints and Mary as an intercessor, and we uh, look as, as born-again Christians to Jesus as our mediator and our intercessor, the Jews held Moses in this kind of esteem as their intercessor and their mediator. And all of a sudden, these men who boast in Moses and being their disciples are told that Moses is going to accuse them one day. This is shocking. By the way, a sidebar note to this, there's a lot of people out there today who doubt the existence of Moses, doubt that Moses wrote the first five books, the writings, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, also called the Pentateuch. There's a lot of people that today, because of liberal scholarship in the 1800s, doubt that Moses was a real guy. And, and you see this reflected in a lot of the so-called documentaries that are out there on the History Channel and such. And we have to ask ourselves this question, can we really think that Jesus was ignorant about Moses in the history of Israel? He was ignorant because he didn't know what men figured out in the 1800s when they started to doubt the Bible? No, Jesus says Moses was a real man. And he was really the author of the first five books of the Bible. By the way, besides that, there's a lot of good archaeological evidence that Moses was real. The Israelites were really enslaved in Egypt. Kind of like there's uh, chariot wheels found in the Gulf of Aqaba that date to the Exodus period. Still sitting there today? Or how about the monotheistic... Um, uh, Pharaoh, I'm um, in Hoptep IV, who as a child would have witnessed the Exodus, and he's the first and only Pharaoh to ever be a monotheist, to not believe in many gods. It's kind of weird, right? 
Why did that happen right at the same time? Well, I think because the Bible's true. But that's a sidebar note. You can't separate Moses and Jesus. And what we're told here is that Moses is going to accuse you. In fact, Moses predicted this unbelief in Deuteronomy 31. He said, take this book of the law and put it by the side of the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Because it will be a witness against you about how rebellious and stubborn you are. Because even while I'm alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord. You see, Jesus says, if you believe Moses, you would have believed me because he wrote about me. The whole testament's about Jesus. Let me give you a quick road through the Old Testament. Ready? Just the first five books that point to Jesus. And if you have a pen, take some notes. Read these verses later. Genesis 3.15. God says, I'm going to, he's speaking to the serpent after the fall of man. Genesis 3.15. I'm going to put enmity, warfare between you, serpent, devil, and the woman. Between your seed, your descendants, and her seed, her descendants. <coughs> he, the seed of the woman, will crush the serpent's head, and you will only crush his heel. Jesus is spoken of as the seed of the woman who will defeat Satan one day. Genesis 9, 26, after Noah gets off the ark, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. It's the God of Shem that the Messiah is going to come through, not the line of Ham or Japheth. He's going to come through the line of Shem. Genesis chapter 12, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, God reveals himself to Abraham, and he says, Abraham, in you, all the offspring of the nations will be blessed because you obeyed my voice. There's someone coming through Abraham's seed who will bless not just the Jewish people, but all the Gentiles in this room today. And then in Genesis 49.10, the scepter will not depart from the tribe of Judah until Shiloh, Shalom, the one of peace, comes. And to him will be the obedience of the peoples. There's coming someone who's going to bring peace in people's hearts, and the people will obey him. And then in Numbers 24.17, which does not speak of Simon Bar Kokhba, like Rabbi Akiba said, the, there Moses says that uh, recording the, the prophecy that was given by Balaam, I see him that's coming, but not now. I behold him, but he's not near. A star is going to come out of Jacob, and a scepter will rise out of Israel. And we know when Jesus was born, what happened? There was a star in the sky that announced his coming, and he came as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. How about in Deuteronomy 18, Moses said, the Lord your God is going to raise up for you a prophet who's like me, but unlike me, him, you will listen to him. Because Jesus is greater than all the prophets of the past. He's the prophet that people will finally listen to and obey. Jesus is represented by the first man, Adam, because he's the second man. What Adam failed to do, Jesus came and did perfectly. He is the prophet Melchizedek in the book of Genesis who has no goings forth, no genealogy. He's always existed as God, but he also came to be the perfect priest to take our sins away. Jesus is the, smitten, the water from the smitten rock who quenches our thirst. Jesus is the manna in the wilderness who feeds our souls. Jesus is the Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the world. He is the pillar of fire who guides us by day. He is all all the instruments in the tabernacle and the temple that point to his coming to save us from our sins. Jesus Christ is seen in that fiery serpent in the wilderness. The people rebelled against God and they were dying by poison of fiery asps. And we are told that Moses was told by God, lift up a brazen serpent across in the desert and if the people will look on it, they will live. And Jesus said, I am that serpent and if you look on me, you will live. We are told about the laws of the Old Testament. Where do you see Jesus there? Well, the Jews got it wrong. They thought if they kept the law, God would be happy with them. The law was not given to make us get close to God. The law was given to show us we are separated from God and we need someone to come and do what we cannot do. The Jews looked at the ceremonial laws, like the priesthood and the garments and the sacrifices, and they thought that those things were enough to make God happy. But Jesus, they were pointing to him. They were pointing forward like the Lord's Supper points back to what he did on the cross. 
And my friends, at the end of his time on earth, Jesus could teach a Bible study in Luke chapter 24, in which beginning at Moses and then all the prophets, he declared all the words about himself. In other words, you can't separate Moses and the first five books from who Jesus is, because Jesus is God. And this ends in verse 47. How will you believe? The whole Bible points to me. And if you don't believe Moses, how will you believe my words? It's interesting that Jesus gave a story, a parable in Luke 16 about the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man died and he was thrown into Hades. He was suffering the punishment of God, the wrath of God, the judgment of God. And we learn a little truth that's very important in there. In hell there are prayer meetings. Because this man who was suffering the judgment of God was praying that God would send Lazarus back to the earth to warn his family so that they would not come suffer the same fate. Oh, Abraham, that, that would you send Abraham to go and warn my family that they would believe before it is too late? Well, we are told, Abraham said to this rich man who suffered, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Abraham said, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. In other words, we are indicted here. Why don't we take Jesus at his word? Well, we don't take him at his word for four reasons. Because we have a lack of desire to come. We lack love in our hearts. We lack the desire for God's praise. And we lack faith in God's word. G. Campbell Morgan was a great preacher. Well, quite some years back. He was the past, pastor at Westminster Chapel. And, and as a 19-year-old young man, Campbell Morgan's ministry was blessed as he preached the Word of God. People were being saved. But he also began to read some books outside of the Bible. He started to read Thomas Huxley and Charles Darwin, some of these other writings. And he began to have a, a crisis of faith. And the words he had been preaching and that God had blessed, he started to struggle with some doubts whether they were true or not. We are told that he immediately canceled, canceled all of his preaching engagements as a young man. He put all his books in a cupboard. He locked the door. He put his Bibles that he had to the side. And he went to the bookstore and he bought a brand new Bible. No notes. No presuppositions. And he said to himself, I am no longer sure if this is what my father claims it to be, the word of God. But of this I am sure, if it be the word of God, and if I come to it with an unprejudiced and an open mind, it will bring assurance to my soul of itself. In 1883, G. Campbell Morgan said these words, that Bible found me. And he was changed. And he went forward with a greater ministry used of God because he took Jesus at his word. And I say today, if you take Jesus at your word, you will leave here changed, forgiven, having the honor of being a son or a daughter of the living God. Let's pray together at this time. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist. And I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.